Good morning from Costa Rica. Thanks for joining us both in person and online. This next conversation is going to be with Volker Turk, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, and it will be led by Marwa Fatafta, Interim Director of Policy and International Programs and uh, the MENA Policy and Advocacy Manager at Access Now. Over to you, Marwa. Thank you, Melissa. All right. Uh, hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, the first day of, of RightsCon. It's so wonderful to meet and be reunited with so many people from around the world. So thank you for being here. Um, I have the absolute pleasure uh, to welcome our guest, uh, Mr. Volker Türk, who is the UN uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, who started his position uh, back in October 2022. Uh, hi, Commissioner. Thank you so much for joining us. I know you have a very busy schedule, so thanks for taking the time to be with us uh, today. Um, to introduce thank you... Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, Sorry. thank you for being with us. I want to give a very brief introduction. As I mentioned, you are currently the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, you have devoted um, your long and distinguished career to advancing universal human rights, uh, and notably the international protection of some of the world's most vulnerable people, refugees and stateless persons. Uh, you've held a number of positions uh, at UNHCR uh, and in different parts of the world. Um, I want to start uh, with, uh, with your mandate. You have been now in your new post for almost eight months. Uh, and you, of course, have an incredibly huge and challenging mandate. Um, and a focus of the discussion of, of today and during the days of RightsCon is around AI, and in particular, uh, recent developments related to generative AI. What are, from your perspective, are the biggest challenges presented by digital technology for the human rights movement? Well, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really sorry that I'm not uh, there in person. As you, as you can see from, from my background, I'm here because of the Vienna Plus 30 symposium that is as a result of 30 years Vienna Declaration and Program of Action, as you know, there was a big world conference on human rights here 30 years ago, it also paved the way for the establishment of my office. Um, and of course, I had to be here, given the fact that this is the big anniversary of, of one of the anniversaries that we have. But I, I have followed very closely and I've been in touch with some of you uh, over the last couple of months about the genie that has been left out of the bottle, which frankly, is generative AI. Mm. And from a human rights perspective, it's definitely one of our priorities in the human rights office. Mm. I know it's a big concern for many of you, journalists, human rights defenders, but also all those who understand so much better how deep how the technological world impacts on human beings. And I think if I were to say what's the urgency of it, it's really to ensure that there is an emphasis on the impact many of these developments have on human beings, which brings us right into what human rights can offer by way of solution. Um, it's clear also that artificial intelligence has huge potential. We see that the way it is developed the way, the way it is used, the way it's going to be regulated, will need to be done within the human rights movement. And it is on us in the human rights community to be ahead of the curve, mm. which is very difficult because we don't necessarily always have the transparency about this development. We may not even have the expertise because this is a very specialized expertise, but we need in order to rise to that challenge of finding ways to address this quite significant risk that we have when it comes to facial recognition, biometric uh, issues around it. I mean, the fact that purchases is biases uh, from a racial perspective, from a gender perspective, from a global south perspective, feed into some of this. We need to absolutely ensure that 
the human rights guardrails influence both the development, use, and the regulation mm. of generative AI. And, and I think we need to become quite granular about it. Mm. It's, it's one thing to talk in, a, in the abstract about the rights framework and that it applies, that it applies this type of uh, development, but then also what does this concrete mean and what type of tensions does it raise mm. and how do we address it? Thank you so much. Um, I want to zoom in on, on what you mentioned regarding having guardrails and the urgency to develop those as AI and generative AI starts to seep into our lives. Uh, what urgent guard uh, guardrails do you think we, we need at the moment? I mean, first of all, we need a sense of urgency. And that's the, because otherwise nothing happens. And we have seen within Member states, we have a piece within the European Union. I've just briefed about it uh, in much more detail. There is an AI regulation that has been drafted and that is supposed to be finalized. So at least there is one regular framework. But we have seen also in the US uh, quite some concern and some discussions that are taking place. So it's clear that that sense of urgency needs to trigger action. And, and we need, as a result, much more transparency about what is actually happening. That's that's quite important, mm. as well as requirements for risk assessments um, and potentially broad limitations on how generative AI is done. Mm. Um, so it's really trying to see how do we deal with the development and the use and the regulation of it? Just to give you an example, right to privacy or non-discrimination implicates the way that generative AI collects data or what labor rights. Um, so we do need, as apart from the sense of urgency, transparency, uh, the sharing of data, um, but also making sure that there is a continuous dialogue with the companies that develop it. Mm. As we have now seen some of the developers, some of the, even the CEOs become concerned, uh, but that's not enough. We obviously need to make sure that they understand that there are huge issues and what do they then concretely mean? Uh, and also almost a training for them when it comes to human rights due diligence, risk assessments, strategic foresight. And we saw it in the past on social media platforms. I remember when it first were developed, it, you all heard how it would change communication and, and everything else, and there was but there was not enough strategic foresight to know what the impact will be on many aspects of our lives and and the shadow side of it. And so it is going to be important mm. to learn the last from the past. Because now we are seeing, of course, on social media platforms, a number of things that are happening. They're happening a bit too late mm. when we already see There could also be an, I think with interest in the rights call of this, I think I'm sure so many of you have thought about it. We need at the international level, uh, the type of approaches that we have seen in climate change or when it comes to the nuclear side. We have an international agency, National Atomic Energy Agency, that deals both with the positive aspect of nuclear technology but also negative aspect. And maybe we do need at some stages a type of you know, entity that deals with it. You know, making sure that the benefits that that it's a global public good, but also that the guardrails are there and the role and monitoring of it doesn't go into the military domain in a way or in the, in the curtailing of fundamental rights um, that we would all hear if it goes wrong. 
Thank you. I mean, that's a very interesting proposal. Um, and I, so please hold on to that thought. I will ask you a question um, about the existing UN initiatives and where we can focus our attention and energy moving forward. But I agree that there is a lesson learned for us. And I think we're maybe as a community are better prepared this round uh, to ensure that human rights is baked in um, in the development and deployment of AI technologies and particularly generative AI as it continues to develop um, and be widely used. Um, but as you mentioned, um, there's, we're not only talking about AI, we're also taking, I mean, generative AI, but we're also talking about biometric collection, biometric surveillance, facial recognition, um, and the, the threats posed by AI are linked with many other threats that have a direct impact on human rights defenders, on civil society leaders, on participants that are present today, whether in the room or online. Um, and we have seen you know, the RightsCon experience and the, the issue around the borders and visa deni denials that uh, some participants have unfortunately experienced just reminds us about the civic shrinking civil civic space that we have uh, you know, at, in, in our world today. Um, and from, from your perspective, from your mandate, what are the biggest challenges uh, you see in protecting civic space today? And also, what is the way forward um, in trying to push against this rising authoritarianism from different corners in the world? I mean, there are different aspects to that. And I'm sure all the colleagues who are part of, of the conference, but also those who are online, especially human rights defenders, live it on a daily basis and really my solidarity with them. Because of course the online space has become as important as, the, as offline life, our offline lives. And, and what has happened, and that's one area that is particularly dangerous when it comes to hate speech, for example, incitement to violence, we see how, uh, and that's always a challenge with the rights community, how do you deal with it in the absence of an international agreed definition of speech? But it doesn't mean that you can't address, even from a human rights perspective, what is acceptable and what is then hate speech that is that when hate speech is unacceptable. But how does it, besides, uh, it leads to incitement to violence, what type of measures can we take to avoid that? And I know that a lot of human rights defenders. Um, um, women in often public office or in, in political positions where social media platforms have done everything to harm them. And so there is that challenge how we deal with. The other one is harmful disinformation. Mm. We've seen it during COVID, during the COVID pandemic. We've also seen it um, through the spreading of conspiracy theories that really impact on what then uh, democratic space means. I mean, we have seen people believing in that kind of thing. It almost becomes cult-like. Um, brainwashing uh, in, in some ways, um, which is harmful to themselves, but also, of course, to their communities and uh, to their societies. And we do need, especially when it comes to communication, quite strong, much better way of, of, of tackling this. And actually there is currently an initiative on the way by the United Nations in which we participate, which is actually to counter harmful disinformation and to also ensure that independent free media are strengthened because it allows us to ensure that information that the media share are much more represented independent and free media. Another issue is, of course, spyware. I mean, in fact, we have, my office has continued to advocate for states to implement a moratorium on the sale and transfer of surveillance technology until there are sufficient hardware in place. I mean, we know how spyware and surveillance tools in both democracies and in authoritarian um, type countries with, you know, without any judicial oversight, any public scrutiny have wreaked havoc. And, and that's a big concern. And of course, technology comes in as a big tool to, to ensure that this, I mean, to both make sure that we um, ensure that it's, it's not that we find out that it's happening, but it's also the very tools 
that are used for, for these type of things. And, and we really to advocate very strongly for a moratorium on that. Um, internet shutdowns, another big issue, of course. We know Sudan is the latest example. Um, internet shutdowns uh, are often happening in crisis situations, and it is an attempt by those who wage war or by those who repress to ensure that information does not get out that needs to get out. And again, internet shutdowns, there is the whole human rights framework that provides also a solution to states of how to handle different aspects of it. Uh, we know and we see almost all internet shutdowns are disproportionate, too broad, too vague. They have an indiscriminate effect on uh, rights, freedom of expression, access to information, of course, education and health. And we need to make the case very powerfully why these are not the tools to be used in crisis situations. And if there are certain restrictions to it, that it needs to be explained, we need to monitor it much better. Um, and we also need to make sure that some of, I mean, that these type of things are happening in a framework that, that is agreed internationally. Thank you. Um, some of the issues you've outlined uh, from hate speech to online violence, um, social media companies and tech companies at large have a major role to play. Uh, and this brings me to uh, the question or the effort that you um, have done. You, you, last November, you wrote to Elon Musk uh, an open letter asking him to make sure that human rights are central to the management of the company and the platform, which unfortunately is also closing up. Um, I'm curious, and I guess many others in the audience are curious as well, did you receive a response from, from Musk? And maybe a larger question here, how do you engage with the tech companies and uh, what are your main asks and demands of them? So I remember the day very well. It was a Friday and we had an issue with Twitter and I asked my colleagues, could you get in touch with the human rights team? Only to find out that the whole team had been fired. Mm. So it was a Saturday when we came together and we said, we need to write something about this. This just becomes insane. And indeed, we, I issued this public letter, this open letter, which interestingly got a lot of coverage and a lot of interest. I think it resonated with a lot of people beyond Twitter, with social media platforms more generally, because I, I remember when I was dealing, especially with Myanmar, but also in the context of Ethiopia, where social media platforms were used to propagate hatred, incite to violence, where frankly, the ethnic displacement of the Rohingya was also because of un totally uncontrolled, uh, without any content moderation type things uh, that really incited violence uh, and, and led to loss of life and displacement and all kinds of very serious human rights violations. So I didn't get a response. Mm -hmm. I only saw a further, and you mentioned it, a further deterioration in the way that Twitter handles um, the type of issues that we need. That, for instance, the API, I mean, the, the fact that they uh, ended the policy of open access to data through its API system is, is another worry. Um, uh, and I mean, we, of course, we call for freedom of expression. Uh, but it's not without limits, uh, because we do need moderation practices. Um, we also call for resisting government attempts for censorship, but we have reports on a number of social media platforms that they seem to be, including Twitter, that they seem to be accepting more yes. censorship. So again, the war is Indeed, and we've seen that before the high-risk elections in, in Turkey, or high-stake elections in Turkey, where uh, Twitter responded to government requests to block accounts of um, political opposition. And, and that, of course, we hope, uh, you know, it, it's a reminder for us of the challenge ahead and also of the ecosystem and the structure that we are dealing with of what are digital civic spaces and how we can protect them when they're owned by private actors. Um, 
I want to move to a um, slightly different topic or angle. Uh, you have carried out a number of visits uh, to different countries, um, including in this region, um, that are either going through current turmoil and armed conflict or um, are in, in post-conflict situations. Um, to name a few, you've been to Sudan, Ukraine, uh, Haiti, Colombia, Venezuela, to name a few. Um, and protecting human rights and human rights defenders and journalists and, and uh, at-risk communities um, in times of conflict and crisis uh, is a particular and huge challenge at the same time. So what is your office doing um, to ensure the protection of at-risk communities, including uh, women, LGBTQ uh, plus communities, uh, refugees, uh, and so on? In, it's, I've been now seven months in office, and I've been to about 13 countries. And one principle for me is always to make sure that that's part of the program, that I have free unfed access to civil society access human rights defenders to victims of human rights violations. And if that's not accepted, that won't come in the visit. So that's the sine qua non of the visits. And also, whenever we open a presence in the country, that's part of the package. And that in and of itself is important because we are, we would like us the Human Rights Office to be the bridge builder between civil society, human rights defenders, victims, and the institutions of the state, especially when there is a rupture within, when there is social rupture between the relationship, because that's what often happens in this type of crisis situation. So we can come in providing a safe space. There is a lot of care, that we, but also analyze the concept. We can ensure that people can speak to us and listen to them, we can hear their concerns, but also for us to be able to respond to what they say and find strategies to overcome. I wish I could open much more of its presences around the world. There has been some positive developments, but also negative developments. We are going to close my Uganda, for example, which uh, in Asia, we hope to be able to strengthen our presence. There is always pros and cons in all of this, but having an office presence, I think, helps also provide space for civil society. Of course, in society, we always see civil society, but we are in solidarity. So we want to make sure that it's also understood by everyone who needs to understand it, but it's a incredibly important role in societies and crisis. Um, thank you. Hi, Commissioner. I want to go back to the idea you proposed of having a, some, some kind of a global setup to face the challenges uh, brought by these new technologies. Um, on human rights. Um, there are several UN initiatives addressing tech and human rights uh, and they are proceeding in parallel. Um, how does your office approach these various work streams, you know, from the Global Digital Compact to the UNESCO's um, platform governance uh, effort to the um, WSIS plus 20? Um, and for us as civil society with limited resources and capacities, where do you think we should focus our effort and attention? So, as you know, my, my office also has the BTEC project, which is an important one, engaging directly with the companies when it comes to making sure that they understand the rights I mentioned. We're trying to expand when we have a community of practice with the BTEC, we're also trying to expand it to Africa and globally. But it's always about the education of the guiding principles of business and life. And sometimes companies, to work through what it means concretely, and, and that's really important. But that's one project, it's an important project. Uh, it helps us also learn a lot uh, through this engagement, which then feeds into all these different UN processes. And we are involved, and we follow them all. 
I think we have sometimes a bit of the problem that many of you have, which ones to be prioritized and which ones will actually help us advance with my nice course. I, I, I mean, it's clear you have just probably seen the issuance of, by the Secretary General, the policy brief on our digital compact contributed not. Uh, I'm, in my office is in touch with the tech envoy's office. And, uh, we, we want to also make sure that in his work and that human rights is seen as a cross cutting issue that yeah. affects each and every aspect of technology development, and that human rights is seen as providing a solution to the challenges of the thing. I mean, on, I, I don't think we can wait for the digital compound to come. This will take some time, and you know, the summit of the future next year. We could need an initiative much earlier, and I'm in touch uh, with, with a couple of my brothers and sisters within the UN and the broader system to see what we could take. And I'm also very much looking forward to learning the conference from some of the things that you think we should do mm. and prioritize in Italy. Um, for civil society, because it's good. I mean, where are the hubs in the tech in the tech world in relation? It's clear that it's OHHR, the rights this is what the treaty bodies are doing in the council. Of course you have UNESCO with more specific aspects maybe to their number and you have tech envoy. Um, but if we look at the if you look into the future, um, the global digital compact is going to be one that to all invest in a lot because it will go to them. Thank you. And this brings me to the last question uh, for our interview today. Um, we've heard quite a lot uh, about the Human Rights 75 uh, campaign. And uh, for those who um, haven't heard of it uh, or curious to learn more about it, if you could tell us what it's all about, why is it important, and how can um, participants in this conference uh, can take part or contribute to this campaign? So it's the biggest opportunity for all of us to care about human rights, to ensure that we put human rights back where it's to be, mm. that it is a force to reckon with, that it's a force for social change, that it's universal, I don't have to go through the whole doctrine of universal, indivisible, related and interdependent, but it's something that the world has lost because of the geopolitical tensions between. And it's a huge opportunity to make sure that societies large are engaging with the base of human rights and see the transformative thing. So we are organizing national consultation. I hope that a lot of you will be able to participate in them. We want governments, member states to come back with informative pledges. What are the type of commitments they could make in order to ensure that human rights are fully implemented, promoted, that they are also a solution to the big challenges that we face, climate change, uh, that digital. But we also want to go beyond it. member cities. I think everyone, mm. NGOs, international organizations, individuals, can look at what type of legislation they would like to make. Um, we will have, and then we have regional consultation, we will also have semantic consultation, including, by the way, on mm. the digital. And, and at the end of the year, 11th and 12th, December, we will have a number of events to collect the pledges, to build a pledging tree. And we also want to have some really vision discussion about solutions to the big issues of our time. Um, and vision statement come out that, that could feed into the summit of the future next year, but also influence our own management plan, our own strategies, and inspire all of us as 
we cra grapple with some of the big human rights issues that we face. And it's climate change, it's civic space, peace, it's issues of the digital world, um, but it's also economy and economic systems, whether they still serve human beings or are in fact acting against them. Thank you so much. Um, you have a, a long task moving forward as w us as well as, uh, as a digital rights community. And that's why we're here at RightsCon, whether online or in this conference today in the room uh, to discuss, strategize and help shape the world we want to live in. Thank you so much again for being with us today, despite your very busy schedule. Good luck in Vienna and thank you so much everyone for being here and tuning in. Thank you very much. Great to see you. And looking thank forward to a lot more engagement. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye bye. Bye. All right. Uh, just to say to everyone, thank you and I wish everyone a successful RightsCon experience over the coming three days.